what um, we'd like to do now is move on to the next in our ongoing wave of, um, of presenters on with expertise and, and um, thoughtful contributions to the question of the demeanor of democracy. So our final panel on the uses and misuses of civility in public discourse will be Professor Tom McAfee from here at the law school and Professor Dimitri Shawin, who has organized this event. Professor McAfee is going to speak first. He is a, a member of the faculty here at the Boyd School of Law since its founding. He is a distinguished and nationally known constitutional law scholar. His expertise is particularly in areas that include the Ninth Amendment and the structures of the United States constitutional democracy. He'll be followed by Dimitri Schauen. Dimitri Schauen is a, a professor here in the sociology department, director of, and really creator and, um, and ongoing visionary of the UNLV Center for Democratic Culture. His own scholarship is in areas of social theory, pragmatism, democratic culture, and the issues of emotional intelligence. So we'll start with Professor McAfee. Um, I have uh, relatively few bona fide addictions in life. Most things can just come and go. But one of the few I have is a preference, if it's possible, to watch a particular television show, which I admittedly very seldom miss, is the one entitled, uh, Odd Enough, Fox News Watch. And what it amounts to is a weekly critique of the public media's treatment of the big stories of the past week, as well as treating as non-coverage stories that perhaps should have captured their attention and interest. What I find so compelling is this sheer attention to the ins and outs, the whys and wherefores, uh, the legitimate considerations, and the cheap and easy motivations that explain many coverage and non-coverage of, of the news stories of the past week. Sometimes I've thought that it would be useful to have a MacVeigh's Constitutional Class watch, uh, maybe even a Boyd Law School watch, that tends to where our faculty, students, and administration expends time and energy trying to understand the law and its role in American society. If such a thoughtful and careful analysis, a critique, were offered on these topics each week, would almost certainly become a source of motivation and we have to have an inspiration to see things that we currently lose or simply waste time and to discover where our efforts at civility and public discourse proves useful and helpful and when it becomes an unfortunate kind of pandering to the preferred views of some constituents. Let me begin with an obvious example of the misuse of civility and public discourse. Uh, one that illustrates as well uh, uh, a perhaps growing awareness and awareness of how some forms of some, a public discourse may be pointless or futile. In a recent issue of the AALS News, uh, that's the newsletter of the Association of American Law Schools, William Hines offered what he compared to and distinguished from David Letterman's top 10 recital. It was his uh, list of top 10 changes in the world of law schools. Now, on Professor Hines' list of important changes was the impact of the U.S. News and World Report rankings of American law schools. Now, what may have been disappointing, speaking for myself, and not Professor Hines, was not just that there is surprising, but one attempt to say shocking number of enthusiastic consumers of these precise rankings. Central University officials, boards of trustees, legislators, alumni leaders, potential donors, faculty candidates, current and prospective students. What is so hard as this? On the one hand, most who are well acquainted with American law schools hold a surprisingly consistent and indeed rare agreement that these rankings are deeply flawed and should not be taken at all seriously. On the other hand, there still exists, given the popularity of the rankings, 
and the enthusiasm of its many consumers a veritable torrent of promotional materials designed to raise the visibility of law school programs in the eyes of deans, faculty members, judges, and lawyers uh, who are invited uh, to complete the reputation surveys that make up 40% of these rankings. Now, in times of tight budgets, it's easy to imagine that schools could put their resources, uh, the resources expended this self-promotion to more productive academic uses. This is public discourse that may excel in its degree of civility, but that doesn't stop it from being virtually worthless, not to mention a tremendous waste of time and money. Uh, to complete the good news, bad news device of today's story, another category of Professor Hines' top 10 list was what he described as the renewed emphasis on professional ethics and responsibility. Hines observes that ostensibly emphasizing lawyer ethics has been an official part of legal education, at least since Watergate. So that a required course in lawyer ethics has been part of the curriculum in first all American law schools, at least since the 1970s. Even so, many for years believed that the conventional course was both over and under inclusive to the ethical sins that brought us Watergate. Hines contends, however, that today the voices of the academy are both more diverse and they take positions that are both less polar and draw more subtle distinctions about lawyer misbehavior. He sincerely believes that the public discourse in American law schools about legal ethics has really reality gotten much better. Moreover, the range of issues getting attention from both the bar and the academy is much broader than 25 years ago. The AB model code, which has been revised, and the Ethics 2000 report and the Sarbanes of Oxley Law have all intensified discussion of long standing ethics issues. And the globalization of law and legal practice has added a new set of issues to, to, the, to the traditional inquiries. The system remains imperfect, as one might expect, but genuine progress has been made, and the focus seems to have tightened considerably, all I think because of fruitful and ongoing public discourse about how to prefer, improve our performance as teachers of ethics. Often enough, provoking thought and sparking consideration of important issues prompts thoughtful teachers to focus on the unusual and sometimes to engage in the, the level of politically incorrect discourse. In my classes, we speak of uh, abortion, sex discrimination, race, and a host of vexing controversial issues. Sometimes my comments and questions take students back. Uh, when I teach criminal procedure, I find that my uh, family, uh, when I describe to them the content of the course and what my own views are, uh, they view me as some kind of a flaming liberal. On the other hand, my classes almost universally tend to view me uh, as some kind of a law and order conservative. Uh, in fact, i found over the years that when both groups are decidedly disapproving, I figure I've about done my job. Um, now, um, the other, uh, when we do this work, uh, it's possible not to step over boundaries of civility. No public discourse, including the sort involved in teaching, needs to resort to cheap shots the rest of our sarcastic put-downs or language that is insulting or offensive. We should all strive to avoid crossing these lines in any public discourse in which we're engaged. Um, the, the good news here, in my opinion at least, is that we have uh, many informal systems to help enforce these norms. Um, I had the experience just this year of being visited by associate dean who was concerned because I had somewhat gratuitously used the term wetback in a class I was talking about, uh, a genuine class case that involved uh, an illegal alien, but it was not well received nonetheless. Um, well, you know, I was you know, you know, disappointed, needless to say, that I mean, just thought that I would, you know, do something that would not be well received. I went home and was telling my family about it, and, and I couldn't believe it because my, my second oldest son, who's about 25, 
uh, turned to me and said, 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 you know, Dad, that reminds me of the time when you were used to teach at Southern Illinois University Law School, uh, and uh, you got called on the carpet for, uh, you were talking about hard bargaining that's going on, and said, and this guy really jewed this other guy down. He said, that was not well received either. And, and uh, uh, I guess the only good news here is that uh, um, in, in, in both cases, uh, the feedback came and I heard it. And uh, I completely forgotten about the other incident. And, and I, but I can tell you this, I haven't repeated it. So uh, uh, what can I say? Uh, I, I hope that we can uh, all strike the right balances for sure. Thank you. I'll try to be brief so as to leave enough time for perhaps questions and answers. Uh, first, we're talking about ethics here a lot. And if any of you are interested to have a, a CLE in ethics or otherwise, they are available as a sign up sheet. Uh, so I know some of you came here in part for that reason, although I hope it was also interesting on other uh, grounds. Now, I put myself on the last panel on the uses and misuses of civility, in part hoping that I will expound on misuses of civility, assuming that everyone else will be sort of more or less pushing the other side of the story, but actually uh, most of the speakers took exactly the opposite side of the story. So I want to, uh, for the argument's sake, uh, uh, make a case for civility. Uh, it was Chief Justice Warren Berger who once said, I quote, Civility is to the courtroom and adversarial process what antisepsis is to the hospital and operating room. The best medical brains, brains cannot outwit soiled linen or dirty scalpels, and the best legal skills cannot either justify or offset bad manners. If this is true of a courtroom where everything is choreographs just so and rules are so formal, how much more so it should be about the political process and public discourse in general. Uh, I will illustrate you my point and where I'm coming from uh, by using this example. There is a brilliant First Amendment lawyer uh, from the East Coast, and I won't go any further into disclosing personalities, uh, whom I greatly admire for intellectual acuity. I always learn uh, from this person when I hear that person speak. Uh, often um, appearances are on TV, talk shows, and intellectual grounds, I tend to agree with just about everything or most everything I hear there, but emotionally I feel sort of discombobulated, something isn't right. I sense, and I couldn't put my finger on it, what the problem is. Until one uh, uh, day, uh, at one show, it dawned on me. Here it is, the First Amendment lawyer, defending to the bitter end free speech and cutting off his opponents who argue the other side of the story on the limits of free speech every time in a kind of derisive manner, oh, okay, I'll give you B grade for this argument, or all right, all right, enough already. Isn't it a performative contradiction? How can you argue free speech and deny your opponents the right to say something about it, slings or whatever it is they're wanting to say, no matter how obnoxious? That kind of performative contradiction, I believe, points to Democracy being into the demeanor, as I have put it. Uh, we sign in words, we sign in deeds, we sign in the flesh across the signifying media. And it happens all the time that what we say, what we profess in theory, we deny in practice, in our body English, in our actions. Uh, there's misalignment that we need to be aware of between various ways in which we uh, assign ourselves in the flesh, in, in emotions, in words. There's a certain uh, word-body-action nexus, as pragmatists who the would call it. Uh, this kind of performative contradiction is everywhere. I find it in uh, uh, courtrooms when judges who are supposed to be uh, models of judicious temperament who have foul temper and behave themselves as little tyrants. Uh, uh, these are lawyers who take ethics exam and pass them the flying colors only to engage in corrupt practices in their daily life. These are civil rights uh, 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 leaders and libertarians who fight, uh, for, who fight for civil rights all around the world, except they forget the rights of their own employees and their own offices, like paying them on time or treating them in somewhat, uh, should we say, less than uh, benign manner. 
Uh, in that sense, I would say that democracy is not just checks and balances, uh, important though they are, of course. Um, it is also uh, 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 in the flesh. It's also here and now. Because we can appeal to God for improving our world, but God is far away. God knows whether he or she is listening, right? We can appeal to government and hope that they will improve things or go on a local level, but ultimately it's right here and now. If the process is fair, if the process is civil, if we know how to agree to disagree, uh, no matter what the outcome is, is, it's likely to be constructive. Something good will come out of it. And it doesn't really matter who wins or loses because uh, process is as important as outcome in democracy, and often more so. Because whatever consensus we reach on a verbal level through so showing of hands is likely to break down the moment we step into the real world of everyday life, which is so chaotic, where things just are never quite what law or theory prescribes them to be. And when the process is fair, we can carry on with our differences, with our disagreements. And finally, um, I uh, would say that the Center for Democratic Culture, if you look at its mission statement, um, um, uh, suggests that uh, democracy, as John Dewey put it, uh, begins at home in a neighborly community and is first and foremost the quality of experience. We take this to mean that civic virtues are as central to democracy as political institutions, that civil society thrives in the culture which encourages trust, tolerance, prudence, compassion, humor, and withers away when overexposed to suspicion, hatred, vanity, cruelty, and sarcasm. The Center for Democratic Culture has a variety of projects. One of them is leading social indicators, and Governor Green spoke eloquently today about the importance of this thing. And I want to take an opportunity to thank everyone who participated in this project from School of Public Health, from Political Science Department, as well as Clark County and State of Nevada officials and 12 members of sociology department who contributed chapters for this report. Uh, the other level of uh, 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 indicators, less tangible, has to do with civility, has to do with public discourse, negative campaigning, hard to pin, not hard numbers, we cannot quantify it readily. There is still the third level uh, 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 that needs to be mentioned here. It has to do with leading emotional indicators, which is another project that the center undertakes, where we try to understand, take the uh, emotional blood work and pulse of our community. There is a, a survey, emotion survey, called Mood Counts that is available now on the CDC website. It's free, anonymous. Uh, in 15, 20 minutes, you will get a three-page printout of your emotional profile. We do it for various groups from State Bar of Nevada to senior citizen center, to private organization, if you're interested, visit it, please. I hope that as we move on, we shall be able to deal with quality of life and uh, uh, leading indicators uh, in various ways that they matter in our life. Thank you. Five minutes for questions. The, I want to thank all the panelists today so far for so effectively interrogating and challenging the notion of civility. And now uh, it's an opportunity for any of you to interrogate or challenge or bring other comments to not only Professor Shallon and McAfee, but also Professors Lazos and Walton are still with us, Gary Peck of the ACLU, and Jane Ann Morrison of the RJ. Gary Peck. I can't resist Dimitri. Um, of course, I think process is important. That's the point of the last Holmes quote that I read as part of my talk. Um, but I really uh, think the issues are immensely complicated. Uh, Chief Justice Berger's uh, observations notwithstanding, um, the whole issue of what counts as mannerly and civil and what counts as fair are themselves, it seems to me, socially and politically constructed. And to bootstrap on to Sylvia's comment about raising the issue of race um, in the O.J. Simpson trial or any, any other trial is viewed as many a, a, as being exceedingly uncivil and inappropriate. I suspect Chief Justice Berger might think so 
as a matter of fact. And indeed, in all sorts of subtle and nuanced ways, the kinds of stories, you're, it, what appears to be a fair judicial proceeding is oftentimes exceedingly stilted and pinched and limits the ability of people to even tell the kinds of stories they want to tell about the injustices that have been visited upon them. So I think it is for me, I mean to go back to my uncivil impulses, I mean I think being uncivil. But your intentions are good. Yeah, I think being uncivil oftentimes is an important part of a good, robust, healthy democratic culture. And, and so I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very complicated set of issues. So, so Gary, let me just stop you there, Uwe, because I'm looking at the clock, and I, I think you just raised again some of the fundamental questions that perhaps uh, Professor Shallon and very perhaps others Very briefly, if I may. Uh, actually, uh, I, I plan to talk about civility being the weapon of the powerful, and anger being the weapon of the powerless. It's easy to be civil when you know that in the end of the day you'll get what you want, that you're ramming through the power circuits, that uh, you get it all fixed at the government's level, the political assembly, or just have enough money in the bank. But when nobody wants to hear you, when you don't have a chance just to at least uh, say what you have to say, and uh, the deck is stacked against you on social health, sort of practical, pragmatic, hard level, that's where tempers flare. That's when you try to ram it through. And I agree with Sue, it's very important to understand the uses and misuses of civility and how indeed uh, it's culturally coded and how uh, it could be used as a weapon to hit uh, you with that stick uh, when you don't fit certain cultural expectations of civility. But I want to emphasize, I just wanted to address the balance a little bit because the issue is very complex, I agree with you. Uh, I think we need to start with ourselves, and I, 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 I think we need to make some effort to uh, align what we're saying, how we're emoting, and what we're doing. More often than not, there is strategic, ontological misalignment within all three things. And one way in which uh, revolutionaries are different from sages is that revolutionaries want to change the world. Jimmy Swaggart wants to change the world. He's against sin in America. Prostitution. Meanwhile, we learned he's patronizing certain houses of ill repute. Um, the point is that um, uh, the box stops right here and now in this audience and with our own families and our friends. Uh, sages know that. They carry that burden. They are these um, strange attractors who somehow or other, in spite of everything, in spite of all the inanities of the world, manage to create some kind of field around them. And other people notice when you just, they can do something uh, different on that kind of level. This is no way to uh, uh, gain say that doing things on uh, political and uh, legal constitutional level is unimportant. It's just that the balance needs to be struck here. I'm sorry, Gary, you were saying something about the Questions, feel free to button hold whoever it is you were going to ask. Uh, just one word of thanks to all of you, uh, and I also want to tell you that we have another public forum and Justice Democracy Forum coming next year. We have several distinguished speakers like Judge uh, Richard Posner, uh, like Linda Greenhouse, uh, Chief Legal Correspondent for New York Times, uh, philosopher Richard Rory, Stanley Fish, Judge Philip Pro. And we hope to also bring here Justice uh, Breyer for our next one. So uh, look for an announcement. And thank you for being here. And stay right. full length.